Welcome to A Scientific Life, E.K. Janaki Amal and the Patriarchy of Science in the 20th Century. This lecture is a part of the series of public lectures and discussions organized by Science Gallery Bengaluru for its first digital pop-up exhibition, Phytopia. For Phytopia, we hope to bring together engineers, scientists, designers, artists, and biohackers to create an experience where visitors can experiment and explore beyond the kitchen, the lab, and the farm. This program is organized in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center. A warm welcome to today's speaker, Vinita Damodaran. Vinita is a historian of modern India, interested in sustainable development dialogues in the global south. Her work ranges from social and political history of Bihar to the environmental history of South Asia, including using historical records to understand climate change in the Indian Ocean world. She has also written about the life and scientific contributions of Janaki Amal, who is India's first woman botanist. We have an exhibit dedicated to Janaki Amal as a part of Phytopia. You can find a link to that in the description below. Before we begin, I would like to remind our audience that Vidita will be present for a Q&A session after this lecture. You may post your questions in the chat box and we will pass them on to her. You can also find a link to the live Q&A session in the description box. Over to you, Vinita. Thank you very much, Gayatri, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk about uh, E.K. Janaki Amal. Um, and as you correctly said, the topic today is on the patriarchy of science, and this will become quite apparent to you as I go on. So I first came across um, Janaki Amal uh, when looking through a massive volume uh, by W.L. Thomas in 19, which was dated 1956, on man's role in changing the face of the earth. This was a, a very inspired conference that was held in Chicago. And it was about the impact of man, uh, as they then called it, on, uh, on changing uh, the way uh, in which, um, the, uh, in transforming the earth, as it were. And this particular conference had in it um, several papers, very key papers by key scientists, but they were mainly written by white Anglo-Saxon men, with one important exception, which was um, the paper given by E.K. Janaki Amal, who was a distinguished woman geneticist and uh, global plant geographer a professor of botany at Madras and the author of the Chromosome Atlas of Cultivated Plants. Now this became, this is an extremely significant um, uh, uh, paper because uh, what she was doing was uh, talking about the subsistence economy of Indian agriculture. And this particular paper resonated very well in the conference. Now, Janaki Amal was relatively unknown to me at this time, and I then decided to do a little bit of research on who she was and what her work was about. And her contribution to the Thomas volume, as I said, also was contributing not only to the history of uh, environmental uh, and subsistence agriculture in India, but it paid particular attention to the difference between patriarchal matriarchal and tribal agronomies. So Amal in this sense uh, can be said to have pioneered both indigenous and gendered environmental approaches to land use history. And the neglect of her contribution to environmental history and the history of science is notable as she was to become later on a well-regarded and important scientist uh, in the post-independence period. So she sort of disappears from view, though she becomes quite important in the period immediately after post-independence. And this was a, a quest of mine to search for the story of this unknown Indian woman scientist. So what I'm going to be doing in this paper then is contextualizing Amal within the historic of, historiography of science to understand how Amal uh, negotiated uh, the boundaries of caste and race, to understand the patriarchy of science in Britain and India when she was operating, that is between 
1930 to 1980s, the making of a national scientist, to look a little bit at eugenics uh, uh, and uh, C.D. Darlington and J.B.S. Haldane, both very well-known scientists in their own way in Britain. J.B.S. Haldane moved to uh, India, as we know, later on. To look at the networks of national and international uh, science and the constitution of science at the end of empire and after. And to focus a little bit on retirement and environmental activism uh, in terms of Jani Kemal's final career. Uh, one of her contemporaries uh, notes that Janaki Amal was an original thinker, uh, doing, doing epochal work on intergeneric hybrids such as Saccharum Zia, Saccharum Iranthius, Saccharum Imperata, and Saccharum Sorghum. Her pioneering work was on the cytogenetics of Saccharum officinarum, that is sugarcane, and interspecific and intergeneric hybrids involving sugarcane and both closely related grass genera, very close, uh, very distantly related uh, to things like, like bamboo and bambooza. So mainly her work was on creating hybrids. And she had numerous articles, uh, including in Nature in 1938 and Heredity in 1972. So when we, uh, when we look at why she um, disappears um, in terms of... Uh, uh, despite having done such significant work, we need to understand the way in which the historiography of science was written up uh, both uh, in the pre-independence period and in the post-independence period. Much of the historiography focused on the contribution of native male scientists, including um, in the post-colonial period on Indian male scientists, but not on women scientists. And, include, and a, a more recent work which looked at um, women in science in the context of India ignores uh, Janaki Amal. So what we're trying to do here today, as I said, is by situating on, on her work and her career, focus a little bit on this uh, fascinating woman on her life. So she starts her, um, her she was born, as we know, in 1897 in Telichery in Kerala. She goes uh, to Michigan as a Barber Fellow in 1925. And she receives a DSC um, in Michigan in 1931. And this was a very, very significant event. She was the first woman botanist in the US. So a significant first here again. In 1932 to 34, she uh, joins Trivandrum as a professor of botany. And 1934 to 39, uh, she joins uh, the Sugarcane Breeding Institute in Coimbatore. Between 45, 40 and 45, she returns to London uh, and becomes the assistant cytologist at the John Innes, Innes Institute, working with C.D. Darlington in 1951. She returns to reorganize the Botanical Survey of India. And in 1984, she dies after working in her lab in Madhura Vale uh, for the, in her last year. So that is a short uh, trajectory of her life. So her career uh, can be traced to when she started working as a botanist and cytologist first uh, after finishing her PhD first in India as a professor of botany in Trivandrum, and then later on uh, as a geneticist in the Sugarcane Breeding Institute, and later on at the John Innes Institute in London. And this is a very significant. It was here that she studied the origin and evolution of cultivated plants, resulting in the chromosome atlas of cultivated plants, a very, very significant work which she co-authored with T.D. Darlington, and which became a very important source for cytological work on the economic plans of the world. On her return to India in 1948, she became a leading scientist of the nation who wanted to create a national system of generic science. She was able to do this first as director of the Central Botanical Laboratory of the Government of India at Lucknow. And she had several accolades to her name. She was to become the fellow of the Linnean Society of London, the Royal Geographical Society, the Asiatic Society of Bengal, the 
uh, and she started, for example, the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, and became uh, one of its only uh, and one of its first women members. So an honorary uh, Legium Doctoris was bestowed on her in 1955 by the University of Michigan. And one of her scientific contemporaries, C.S. Subramaniam, writes about her passion for plants, crop plants, garden plants, plantation crops, medicinal crops, and tribal plants. So when she uh, uh, joins um, C.D. Darlington at the John Innes Institute, once again, it's a very, very male institute. C.D. Darlington himself is a very male scientist who treats the women working under him as mainly um, people who are in subservient positions. And she was able to challenge this by collaborating with him directly on this, this magnum opus, the, cultivate, the chromosome atlas of cultivated plants. She also in 1944, as I said, became the first woman uh, member um, of the RHS, the first female employee of the RHS, and her focus on uh, polypleiodian plant evolution um, was very, very significant in her during her stint there, which continued on her return to India, where she worked on the genera Solanum, Datura, Mentha, Champagonum, and Diaspora, beside a range of medicinal and other plants. The confluence of Chinese and Malayan plants with Indian floristic elements in the Northeast she said, uh, led to natural hybridization between these and contributed greatly to species diversification. As an officer on special duty, entrusted with the task of reorganizing the Botanical Survey of India post-independence, she became a progressive national scientist. As Subramaniam was to note very perceptively, though cytology was her forte, her work embraced genetics, evolution, phytogeography, and ethnobotany. So how do we then situate her scientific contribution in terms of her personal life? And this is what I want to concentrate on a little bit. It's very, very important to understand the importance of individual trajectories in such a narrative, because these trajectories run across state archived paper trails and the narratives of a person's life link together markedly different places. And in, in some senses, the networks that John K. Mal built up, I think are very, very significant because uh, she became a sort of meeting point for these various influences. So she became in many ways, uh, mobile, uh, effusive, decentered through her connections with uh, different individuals across uh, different regions of the globe. So by looking at such a career, such as Janaki Amal, uh, it helps to shed new light on uh, historical debates on gender, nation, race, and science in the context of uh, empire. So the case here that one makes when we look at a, a biography of a woman scientist such as uh, Amal, is to bring the background of her life into view. Uh, and it, uh, it's a very, very powerful way of narrating the past. So Amal, as I said, came, uh, comes from a, a lower caste um, background in North Malabar. She had a checkered ancestry. Her mother was um, the illegitimate child of John Child Hannington of the Madras Civil Service, a member of the well-known imperial family who had resided in India for generations. And she was one of 11 um, children, obviously one of the brightest. Uh, her siblings, um, her sisters, many of them chose marriage, while she chose a career of science above marriage. And she, in many ways, assumed a very lonely trajectory in life because she had chosen a career in science instead of marriage. And this um, constraining background uh, comes into force and we can see her in terms of the constraining background in terms of gender, caste and race, which she sort of struggled with as she 
climb the hierarchy uh, in terms of uh, the scientific establishment, uh, both the British and the Indian scientific establishment as a lower caste, mixed race Indian. But her achievements, as I said, were phenomenal. Uh, it was when she was working as a lecturer at the Women's Christian College in Madras. She receives a scholarship from Michigan University, where she was granted her DSC in 1931. And this was a time when many British and American universities were barring the entry of women. Uh, and it is in this context that her career assumes, uh, uh, assumes um, enormous significance. When she joined C.D. Darlington at the John Innes Institute uh, in 1931, she's been sent there by her supervisor, Bartlett, to work with him on cytology. And uh, he himself, as I said, um, was a patriarch in science, but her friendship with him signals the start of a very long uh, relationship, uh, professional and personal. Uh, Darlington was one of the most amazing genesis, geneticists, evolutionists, and biological statisticians uh, of the century. His first cytological work, Recent Advances in Cytology and the Evolution of Genetic Systems in 1932 and 1939, respectively, was hailed as a fundamental contribution to evolutionary thought. And when she joins this institute, she joins one of a one of the most formidable team of scientists. And when Darlington links up with Amal, he is very, very impressed by her energy, her independence, her scientific, in some senses, genius. But he is loath to recognize it officially. And the correspondence between Amal and uh, Darlington, which is preserved in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, uh, shows the nature of the relationship where Darlington damns her very often with faint praise while working with her, while collaborating with her on a lot of associated projects. He does not give her the recognition that she needs. Very similarly, when she arrives in India and she has uh, different periods of her life where she's working, as I said, in the Sugarcane Breeding Institute, in 1938 and so on, she faces again, once again, patriarchy of the Indian scientific establishment. And her letters are very, very revealing of this patriarchy. There's one letter she writes in August, 1938, which I quote, uh, and it's up here for you. Uh, and she's writing about the visit of the biologist Reginald Ruggles Gates to Coimbatore while she's working at the Sugarcane Breeding Institute. And the head of the institute at this time is T.S. Venkatraman, a Brahmin. And she says, who is in some senses uh, uh, constantly uh, unimpressed by Amal's efforts to rise within the hierarchy. And she writes about the way in which uh, Venkatraman does it does not recognize her efforts or her scholarship. It's taken, I quote, seven long months to undo the harm that Gates did in the course of a sim single day spent in Coimbatore. Mr. Venkatraman was completely taken in by the professor's keen interest in the work done at Coimbatore. His fund of information and his gracious manner. Hence the doubt expressed not to me, but to Venkatraman about the validity of the Sakharam Zia cross, which stuck in the expert's brain and my note to nature was not sent up to the director of agriculture for the necessary permission to publish it outside India. I very nearly decided to leave the station as a result of this, and life became very complicated. However, I refuse to be defeated, and I'm glad to report that Venkatraman is at last convinced that the cross is genuine. So what she's referring to here, quote close, 
is the fact that Renkotraman refused to recognize that one of the intergeneric hybrids that she was producing was a genuine one. And it was only after great persuasion that she was able to persuade him that this was a very important scientific break breakthrough. And the paper in Nature was finally published in 1938. So she, you see Janaki Amal coming up against this patriarchy, both in the John Innes Institute vis-a-vis -vis Darlington, who damns her with faint praise. And um, there is this very classic uh, letter that Darlington writes about Janaki Amal. Um, the question of Janaki Amal seems to me to be part of a larger problem. Practitioners of cytology in India are very numerous, but cytological work of outstanding interests is unknown. The reason for this seems to be that Indians go in for cytology because they think it is a matter of technique and needs no thought otherwise. Therefore, when I say Janaki Amal understands her work better than anyone else, I do not mean to pay her a vast compliment. I think she is doing sound work and will continue to do so for some time just because a great deal of elementary exploration in this field is necessary and she cannot fail to be of value to the geneticist working with her. Quote close. He further noted, I think it is a great pity that numbers of Indians come to this country to take PhD degrees in cytology just because they think it is an easy subject and having obtained their PhDs, which they never fail to do, return to secure post in India. We refuse to take such people here. So what you're seeing in both these letters, which I've quoted to you, uh, Amal about her treatment by Venkatraman and Darlington on Amal, you can see how her career was thwarted by the patriarchy of science, both in Britain and in India. At the annual meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences, a creation of the Nobel Prize laureate C.B. Raman, uh, uh, Janaki Amal was to note how she, she felt greatly relieved to leave at the company of the Sugarcane Breeding Institute. She said it was jolly to get back among the few real scientists of India after the pseudo-scientific atmosphere of Coimbatore. A contrast between Raman and Venkat Raman is very great. But C.V. Raman, as well as we know, was not immune to um, imposing his own patriarchy uh, on the scientific lab that he ran. So I think this was a problem uh, for women scientists in general in this period at that time. Johnny Gimbal returns to England um, in 1939 to attend the 7th International Genetical Congress. And she's unable to go back because of the war to India. And this is when she has a second stint in England where she works on the chromosome atlas of cultivated plants. And she also uh, joins the Joan Innes Institute at that time. And later on, she joins uh, the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, where she develops the Magnolia Cobus Janaki Amal as one of the first female employees of the RHS in Wisley. At this time, um, constantly both Q and the RHS are sending plants to her. For example, in one case, an Argentine couple claimed to have developed a grass with exceptional qualities. And this was passed on to Sir Jeffrey Evans at Kew, a leading scientist, who, who in his reply uh, related uh, that this grass was sorghum Halopanese, as identified by F.W. Ballard of the Herbarium. When Darlington sent the specimen to Janaki Amal, she deferred from both the Argentine couple and Ballard, identifying the plant as the recently described sorghum alum. So here was a, a woman scientist who was challenging the male scientific establishment. And you can see why it did not go down very well. Here she is, a very beautiful image of her in London with uh, Oliver Darlington, uh, C.D. Darlington's 
son. The next stage of um, her life is when she comes back to India and then she begins working uh, and the, the, the story is that she travels back uh, on a plane uh, in 1948. It is uh, a Nehru's approach that gets her back to India. Nehru's on that plane. It's unclear whether they both spoke, but clearly Nehru is very keen to get important scientists to return to India and to take up important positions in India. And this was uh, the 1950s was also a very, very important decade for Indian science when nationalist scientists such as the notable chemist S.S. Bhatnagar and Meghnath Saha, uh, the eminent astrophysicists, were part of the scientific establishment. And she joins the scientific establishment in holding up the baton for pure science um, and not for applied science. And Saha was to note, for example, that pure science is the seed of applied science and the neglect of pure science would be like spending a large amount of manuring and plowing the land, but then to omit sowing of any kind. So this was a, a debate about wh whether you ne needed science in the universities and needed to encourage science in the universities or to have a more utilitarian idea of science where science uh, remained uh, in physical laboratories and nationalist institutions. And S.S. Bhatnagar, as we know, sought to reorganize the Council of Industrial and Scientific Research, uh, which was founded in 1942 within the framework of a government-administered science. His views won Nehru over. And though the CSIR continued to interact with Indian universities, it was applied research that dominated the activities of Indian science. And, and Amal was uh, very, very critical of this because she believed that um, damage had been done resulting in the long-term neglect of scientific endeavor in the university. And I just wanted to make this point. Amal also uh, became extremely important when she returned to India to work with a central botanical laboratory in Lucknow, which was uh, set up. And she was uh, asked to reorganize the Botanical Survey of India as the government appointed advisor. However, her academic writing showed a disquiet with the government's increasingly dominant discourse of scientific industrialism. And uh, at the Chicago meeting in 1955, as I said, uh, her paper essayed subsistence agriculture in India, which was quite important because she was talking about the destruction of Indian forests uh, and the destruction of Indian plants. And she writes um, about this when she says, uh, I went 37 miles from Shillong in search of the only tree of Magnolia Griffithi in that part of Assam and found that it had been burned down. So all through the 50s, uh, her botanical investigations continue. Her cytogeographic studies on rhododendron, camellia, Magnolia, Budlia revealed that northeastern Himalaya and the southeastern provinces of China were very active and highly diversified floristically and, and phytogeographically. These areas, uh, she argued, possessed diploids with very wide range, followed progressively by smaller range of polyploids. And her work argued that this was an area which uh, uh, had endemics, uh, which were confined to narrow ranges. So she was in some senses um, uh, challenging the Q tradition and indulging in what uh, you can now call more speculative botany. And after she becomes the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory and she reorganizes um, the Botanical Survey of India, she divides India into six cytogeographical units uh, or circles, each with its own herbarium and a cytotaxonomic laboratory. Her plans came into difficulties when the government appointed a reverend Shantapu, a Jesuit Spaniard, an appointee of, in some senses, um, a prodigy of Q as um, the director of the BSI, Botanical Survey of India. Jani Kamal was devastated and she felt that two years of her work in India had been a waste of time. I quote, once again, the patriarchy of science 
had come in to thwart her. And she writes, the government of India has appointed as chief botanist of India, a man with a Q tradition. And I, the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory, must now take orders from him. Q has won a decisive victory and the news has been jubilantly received there. I'm very angry. As a systematic botanist, I have nothing against him, but I was hoping the botanical survey after its reorganization could be something different to what it was in 1856 when Hooker wrote the flora of British India. Q has won, Sir Edward Salisbury has won, and we have lost. I feel sick when I heard the news I ran away to the wilds of Malabar to collect wild yams that our Aboriginal tribes dig up. So here is Amal once again, defeated after she becomes the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory by a government appointee who's also a prodigy of the Imperial Institution of Q. Uh, and even after independence has some powers in terms of its appointments in India. So some writers have talked about the obstacles to women's experiences of power within science were only matched by the even greater obstacles of legitimizing such power once it accrues through success or prolonged service. The profound difficulty faced by women as holders of scientific authority may also explain their minor showing in major scientific debates, theoretical advances, or large-scale empirical projects, all of which require potential and actual leadership of men. So gender ideology becomes very important in access to and pursuit of scientific careers. And this can account for the curtailment of Janaki Amal's leadership position at important junctures. It's also important to note the continuing influence of metropolitan science in the immediate post-independence context and that the fact that the man of a Q tradition was chosen above her. Johnny Gamal also has a very, very interesting uh, career at this time where she's still collaborating with uh, Holdane and with uh, Darlington uh, it, to uh, understand the castes and tribes of India. And she, con she contributes very, very interestingly uh, to this chromosomal project on, uh, on genetics. And this work is quite interesting. And uh, I don't have time to go into this in this presentation. Uh, but plant geneticists at this time were becoming increasingly interested in human genetics. And eugenics, a term that meant good, good breeding coined by Francis Galton in 1904, was being um, used by a term that was being used also by um, Jebius Haldane and R.A. Fisher, who adopted a mathematical population approach using the gene not as the chromosome, but as a fundamental unit of selection. And these ideas were prevalent in India at this time and had an impact also on Amal, who was supplying, for example, data on castes and tribes to J.B.S. Haldane and to uh, C.D. Darlington. And this link between man, culture, and biology, which uh, finally was dismissed uh, only by the UNESCO conference uh, in the 50s, was had its impact on science also in India. And this is a, a theme that could be, uh, that we could look at um, in the que question answer session. And J.B.S. Holden, who first, who became the first Wilden Professor of Genetics in the University of London in 1937, was at the forefront of these debates. He, as we know, moved to India uh, and um, he became extremely important uh, in debates uh, on science and biology uh, in India and the relationship um, between Darlington, Haldane and Ammal is a very, very interesting part of the narrative of Darlington uh, and Ammal's um, le letters that are now held at the Bodleian. The final years, and this is, uh, I'm moving towards a conclusion. The final years of um, Ammal's life were taken up by uh, her work on the Silent Valley Project this was an amazingly interesting phase of her career. Amal's retirement and environmental activism go together. And by 1962, she had seen herself as too old to be employed by the Indian Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. 
and was looking for new avenues of research. But she continued in the laboratory as an eminent, uh, as an emeritus scientist, toying with the idea of the cytogeography of flowering plants, not cultivated plants. She had done that. This was about flowering plants. And she um, also became very, very interested in uh, an environmental campaign to preserve the Silent Valley. And this debate uh, took up um, a lot of time. As we know, this was about, uh, this was a protest about uh, the dam on the Kuntipura River, uh, which was the, uh, part of a hydroelectric project. Um, and she knew, realized that the Silent Valley in Palakkad was home to a rich variety of plants, mammals and birds endemic to the Western Ghats. And she was very, very upset that the Kerala State Electricity Board had announced plans to begun to begin a dam construction, which would in effect have flooded 8.2 kilometers of virgin rainforest. And the issue uh, did raise a huge public outcry, but Janaki Amal was a very, very important public voice, along with um, other important scientists such as M.S. Swaminathan and B.P. Uh, Paul, who backed the movement. And the work of these scientists, I think, is very, very important, which helped declare the Silent Valley a national park in India. As she wrote to, um, uh, to Darlington at this time about her project, I quote, you will be pleased to know that the Kerala government has been forced to give up destroying the Silent Valley as the oldest forest in India, if not the world. We have set up a project to bring some of the plants and grow them in our ethnobotanical garden. My ethnobotanical garden at Shornur, Kerala, which has a climate similar to the valley, being some 40 miles or so away. So here she has actually created a new project out of her work uh, to protect the Silent Valley, to, to, uh, to force the Indian government to understand the importance of the genetic study of trees. So her active life um, as a scientist and um, advisor to the Ministry of Science and Technology continued in the 70s. Her laboratory garden in Madhuravel at the University of Madras boasted an important collection of economic plants gathered from the wild. And she was asked by the government of India to produce a book on medicinal plants of South India when she was 82 years old. You can see how significant she was. Uh, well enough, she said at that time, to go to the Irula tribes who sell medicine plants and sell them to the native physicians. I found an interesting Solanum hybrid specimen used for family planning by the tribe. Having retired to the University of Madras, she worked quietly in the Botanical Research Lab in Madhuravel in the last years of her life. Her passion for science undimmed. Her last letter to Darlington is dated 4th July 1980, some months before he died. When shall I see you again? Will I see you before I die? It is a very poignant letter. And with the death of Darlington, ended a correspondence that had lasted over 50 years. Amal died working in her research lab at the University of Madras on 7th February 1984. She was 87 years old. Widely, scientists, widely cited in scientific journals and well-respected among scientific circles in her own lifetime, her contribution in Indian science has never been adequately recognized and had been largely forgotten till more recently there's been a spurt of interest in her life. And this exhibition, I think, that you're going to see uh, will go in some way to reviving her um, uh, contribution to Indian science. Her epochal work in cytology, genetics, evolution, cytogeography, and ethnobotany should be recognized uh, and should continue to be recognized. And also her institutional building activities in directing the Central Botanical Laboratory in Lucknow, restructuring the Botanical Survey of India in a newly independent India, and the creation of regional research laboratories as scientific advisor to several government institutions, and finally, her environmental activism in protecting the Silent Valley. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Vinita. It has been a very enlightening lecture. Thank you for your time and for sharing your valuable perspective with our audience. I would like to remind our audience that we're hosting a live Q&A session with her as soon as this session ends. And you can find a link to that in the description box below. Thank you, Vinita. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be able to talk to you. everybody. A very warm welcome and good evening to all of you and a special warm welcome to Vinita Damodaran whose lecture you all have just heard. For those of you who have just joined us, this is part of an exhibition called Phytopia of the Science Gallery Bengaluru. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international gallery international network of galleries across the world. We are eight of us and we are university linked. In Bangalore, we are established with the strong support of the government of Karnataka. And in, as partners, we have the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences and Shristi. This particular program has been organized in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center, who we are absolutely delighted to always collaborate with. I'd like to take a moment to also request you all to please complete the feedback form after you've been through the experience this evening, because it helps us keep improving our offerings, but also to learn more about what you thought about the program. Most critically for this evening, as we proceed, please also post your questions in the Q&A box provided. I'm delighted to introduce the historian Vinita Damodaran to you all. As I was just discussing with her before the program started, the first time I met Vinita was in 1996 when I was a young student in London. And I still remember the warmth with which she received me in Sussex in her office, a warmth that she has shared with students and colleagues um, for a long time now. Currently, she's a professor at Sussex, at the University of Sussex, and she is the director of the Center for World Environmental History. Her work ranges from the social and political history of Bihar to the environment history, environmental history of South Asia, including using historical records to understand climate change in the Indian Ocean world. Her publications are many, but a few that I would like to mention here are Broken Promises, Indian Nationalism and the Congress Party in Bihar, Nature and the Orient, Essays on the Environmental History of South and Southeast Asia, Postcolonial India, History, Politics and Culture, and more recently, East India Company and the Natural World. Our exhibition Phytopia, which I mentioned at the start, features an essay of Vinita's about Janaki Ammal, the plant geneticist, alongside some photographs which she has generously contributed to us. These are up on our exhibition website and those of you who haven't had the chance to see it yet, I'd strongly encourage that you do so. This is the fifth day of our exhibition and we are on for another five. We also have other photographs about Janaki Ammal, courtesy of the John Innes Center, our partners on this exhibition. So those of you who had the opportunity to listen to Vinita talk about Janaki Ammal would have already understood what a fascinating and absolutely wonderfully interesting figure Janaki Ammal is. And I'd like to begin by just saying a couple of sentences and, and, and uh, sort of in, by way of a summary of the lecture that Vinita just gave, but also to lead into a few questions about um, the lecture and Vinita's research on Janaki Ammal. So, as I, as I mentioned, Jana Campbell was a plant geneticist uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century. She worked in India as well as in England, held strong views, um, and was, was one of the very, very small cast of characters, especially female characters, in the Indian scientific enterprise in the middle decades of the 20th century to rise high in ranks, to lead a laboratory, to lead the restructuring and reorganization of other laboratories across India, and 
what I'd like to do is probably start with a few questions that that explore probably to a slightly more extent the questions and the ideas that Vinita raised already in her lecture. So let me start by asking you, um, Vinita, you know, us as, as sort of, you know, historians of science, historians of the environment, the larger historical community of South Asia, we recognize why a figure like Janaki is very, very important. May I ask you to share with our audiences, in your view, why should we, why should we care about or why should we know about Janaki Amal today in India, but also elsewhere? Thank you, Janaki, for that very fulsome introduction. I first came across Janaki Amal, um, as I said in the lecture, when I looked at this uh, book um, on man and nature, which was one of the early books on how man changed um, nature. And it was a Chicago meeting of 1955 when I was producing the book. It, had, uh, it was a conference held in memory uh, uh, of Carl Sauer. It, it had a, a huge number of very important um, agronomists, geographers um, uh, participating in it. And I, I was intrigued to find that there was an Indian woman um, represented uh, in, in the conference and she was speaking of the subsist of, uh, on subsistence agriculture in, uh, in India. And not only was she, the, uh, was she Indian, but she was the only woman participant in the conference. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got uh, researching uh, very quickly on her and discovered, uh, and that she was quite unknown to me at that time. And I then discovered that she had a formidable history, uh, some of which you've just outlined, uh, in being an institutional builder in post-colonial India, in reorganizing uh, uh, the Botanical Survey of India, in heading the uh, Central Laboratory in Lucknow and so on. But she'd been largely forgotten in India. So I just then proceeded on a trail uh, to find her. And then the more I dug, the more, um, I didn't set out to do a biography. I was just intrigued by her. Uh, uh, the more I uh, 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 dug, the more uh, she came out as an original uh, first in many ways. She was the first woman PhD in, um, in botany in the US. She was the first female employee of the Royal Horticultural Society in Wisley Hall. Um, and all these uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all these remarkable firsts uh, had been completely ignored both by the scientific establishment in India and the scientific establishment in Britain, hmm. um, which we then set about trying to readdress in our small way by having a small exhibition on her. Uh, it, where she was remembered was at the Botanical Survey of India in Calcutta hmm. um, um, as one of their directors, and, uh, and they had a bust of her, uh, but she had been largely um, set aside even there. So this was an amazingly important exercise just to uh, redress the lacune in the history of science in India. And um, a book by Neelam Kumar uh, on women in science in India, which was a sort of a reader, didn't have her either, which was published about 10 years ago. So I was just intrigued by the fact of her absence and mm -hmm. wanted to redress that. Um, so you know, outside of the historic sort of, you know, the, the out of, outside of the scientific community or outside of the historian or historians of science community, what would you say to others as to why they should, you know, why, why they should consider a woman of her significance? And, you know, what, what would it have, in a way, taken someone like her to rise to where she did? So she comes from uh, a Kerala, as we know. She is um, comes from a, a, a relatively low caste background, uh, the Tiyas of Kerala. Um, if you uh, know the history of that part of uh, Kerala, which she comes from Malabar, from Telichuri, uh, 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 which was the site of the first English factory uh, in 1600. So there were a lot of uh, uh, British um, uh, planters and traders uh, on that coast hmm. who uh, married local women or cohabited with local women. And so the, there was a whole uh, group of white tiyas um, in Telichuri. So she came from a white tia background, but her um, origins are slightly more uh, interesting. Her, uh, her, uh, step, uh, her grandfather was John Child Hannington of the 
uh, British civil service who had been a commissioner uh, in, uh, in Madras, uh, a, quite a leading civil servant. And her mother was the illegitimate uh, 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 daughter of Kurumbi, who was uh, one of the local women in uh, Telichery, who, uh, 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 and they had a, quite a long-term relationship. It was not a short-term relationship. It was a 20-year relationship that John Charles Huntington shared with Kurumbi. And the, the result was Johnny Kemal's mother, who married into quite a uh, illustrious local family of Thea's, and Janaki Amal was um, uh, one of 11 children um, of, this, of this union between her mother who was then um, 14 or 15 and her father who was 34 uh, and who became um, under uh, John Child Huntington's patronage, a sub judge of the Teletary Court. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a very, very interesting uh, <clears throat> background. She was very well educated, but after her father's death, uh, um, the, the family uh, uh, was growing up in sort of genteel poverty. Um, and they are, uh, but it's quite a westernized uh, family. The diaries of her brother talk about learning geography in school, snipe shooting, uh, and so on. So it, it was, the, the girls um, and the boys had quite a westernized education, but she made most of that education by deciding not to choose marriage but to choose um, a life of uh, edu uh, 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 education above uh, marriage. And when she went to Madras to further her education and her studies, she was picked up um, as a barber scholar and went to Michigan. And then there was no turning back because she joined as a barber scholar in 1924. She then became a barber fellow in 1928 and she got her DSE in 1931. So the trajectories were quite remarkable uh, and shows a highly spirited, highly individual uh, trajectory, which, uh, which I have highlighted as bordering on the cusp of caste and race. And this marginal, um, the marginal uh, 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 life that she, you know, that the borders, that because she inhabited these boundaries between caste and race, she was able to develop a quite a creative um, career uh, mm -hmm. and identity for herself. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it, it's as much a social history of India as it is a social, a cultural history of gender and, and um, also access to higher education, the choice of a scientific career. I mean, many, many strands that actually, you know, uh, come together because, you know, like, like when I said it, um, uh, at, at the start that, you know, she's one of the very, very few people uh, or cast of characters, especially female uh, characters in the Indian scientific community at that time. I mean, the only other person I can think of is Anna Mani, uh, you know, who came close to accomplishing the kind of things that Janaki Amal did. Um, I'm not going to ask you the question of has anything changed since, because I think many of us in many ways know the answer to that, but we might come to that uh, later. I'd love to know your reading uh, of her relationship Two, two men who come, that, that comes through very strongly in your lecture, but also, you know, things that we've known um, in the archives that have been preserved, of course, not, not much, unfortunately, uh, has been preserved. Uh, her own letters, if I'm not mistaken, have been, um, have been destroyed, but it's only sure, letters yeah. that she wrote to others that survive in their personal papers, and yeah, archives, yeah, especially yeah. Darlington and, and Haldane. So I'd, I'd love to know your reading of her relationship um, with Haldane as well as Darlington, uh, and also a comparison between the two, because these are two, you know, very, very highly regarded figures in the middle decades of the 20th century, with Haldane's, of course, sort of very colorful history also and his association with India and the, and the work that he did after coming here. Uh, but also one more person who I would like to throw into the mix, although he absolutely doesn't belong in that mix, uh, is, the, is, is the first prime minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru who I imagine had at least some correspondence with her, uh, given, you know, given the kind of positions she came to occupy, it's hard to imagine that she wasn't in a way known in those circles or you know, um, in a way moving around in those circles. So could you tell us a little bit more about her relationship individually to Holden Darlington and, and the first prime minister, but also uh, especially the differences be, um, in her relationship between say Holden and Darlington and how they, how they panned out or how they figured out in, the, in how her career unfolded. Yeah. 
So both Holden and Darlington were leading um, scientists of the time, uh, mathematical statisticians, uh, biologists, cytologists of eminence. And she uh, established independent relationships with both of them. Uh, so Darlington um, quite earlier on because her supervisor with whom she worked um, in uh, Michigan had sent her on a quest of Darlington when she arrived in 1931 in London. Uh, she sent him a letter, her first letter. Uh, is a very exploratory sort of letter, um, which I can um, read out, which is extremely, um, you know, it's, it, it, uh, let me just um, quickly find it. Um, um, so here she is. Dear Mr. Darlington, this is the first letter, May 29, 1931. Uh, Dr. Davis of the University of Michigan wrote to you, I believe, to tell you that I should be in England this summer and that I'm anxious to do the cytology of a triploid eggplant mm. at the John Innes Horticultural Institute. I shall be in London from Monday next, and I should like to see you as soon as possible after my arrival. My address will be 62 Lebanon Park, Twickenham. And I would be grateful if you would let me know when it would be convenient for you to see me. Oh, nice. So she, here she is, a very exploratory letter. And she ends up working with him for the next few months. Um, and uh, Darlington, meanwhile, is, is, is sort of leading this very, um, you know, he is seen to be this very colorful character in the, <laughs> in the Institute. He has his own laboratory. Uh, and he immediately takes her under his wing. And what is very interesting is that um, when he takes her under his wing, Darlington is not unknown uh, to have had relationships with several of his female, uh, female researchers. And unfortunately, it looks like, or fortunately, it looks like that Amal uh, was one of them that he briefly had a relationship with. The mentoring of men of science at that time uh, related to no, you know, having some sort of informal and intimate relationships with their female researchers. And unfortunately for Johnny K. Amal, she did come under his, um, his wing mm -hmm. as it were, very, very briefly. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was able to uh, detach herself very quickly and establish an independent career for herself. But it's quite surprising that she does not figure very prominently in a biography of C.D. Darlington mm -hmm. uh, himself. And that was a lacune on the part of C.D. Darlington's biographer, Harmon. Yes. Um, which I think uh, he should note, because she was much more than just one of his researchers. She was quite a prominent researcher, and she developed, and she went on to collaborate quite extensively with her on the chromosome atlas of cultivated yes. plants. Yes. Um, but he did have an uh, influence on her in terms of because Darlington was at the um, at the right of the eugenics movement. Uh, uh, because uh, as we know, um, uh, it, uh, the history of genetics which uh, uh, he was a man who seemed to have invented the chromosome. The history of genetics at this time was rapidly moving towards the direction of eugenics. The links between eugenics and genetics in the 1930s are quite well known and have been yes. researched. And Darlington was um, uh, using uh, Amal as a collaborator in his early genetic forays. And he was very interested in the castes and tribes and races of India. Hmm. And uh, Johnny Kemal uh, became a member, very, very interesting, in 1931 of the Eugenic Society in Britain. Um, oh, wow. Uh, which is quite okay. interesting. Well, well, her relationship with Holden uh, is, more in, uh, is more unusual and interesting. They were, Holden, of course, as we know, came back to India and he uh, was at the left of the eugenics movement. He had, of course, was highly critical of eugenics. Um, and he, his relationship with John K. Mull was primarily on the basis of getting contributions to mm -hmm. the journal heredity that he had set up. Um, and uh, they both uh, uh, disliked Ruggles Gates, who was the husband, um, the ex-husband of Maurice Stopes, who was someone who uh, uh, was uh, considerably uh, not... Um, uh, on a level playing field with Amal either tried to detract her detract from her work. So there were these all these local politics that she was engaged in. But hmm. she managed to rise above them and establish quite independent scientific relationships with both these men, uh, apart from having a, had a brief affair with Darlington in the 1930s.
Yeah, and and the first prime minister, whatever little you might. Yeah, and with Nehru, the relationship was quite interesting. She clearly was on a plane with him in '48. Whether mm -hmm. she spoke to him, she just remembers the fact that um, he uh, he was met off the plane. There were crowds, uh, but later on, she did. Uh, she attended several meetings with him. She her letters, you know, she's never a name dropper. So she says, yes, spoke to Nehru. So it's quite clear that uh, Nehru was quite instrumental in her uh, setting up, um, uh, you know, her, uh, her uh, later on her importance as a national scientist. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes across in her letters, but in a very humble, in a completely, um, you know, offhand sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and that was quite remarkable about her because um, she never let on how important she was even to her own family. Mm -hmm. uh, because she was writing letters from all over the world. She was in Russia. She was, she had uh, Hungarian scientists, Australian scientists she was working with. She was traveling around the world. Um, Darlington would write in his diary, had Chelsea and crumpets with Jarnicky. I had uh, the, had uh, crumpets and curry and crumpets with Jarnicky in Chelsea. Sorry. Right. I had curry and crumpets with Jarnicky in Chelsea. Uh, but it was always, it was just, yeah, she, you know, it's a remarkable life for someone Yes. Um, and all these equivocal un encounters, or, uh, which possibly the cusp of empire also allowed, um, which we see as the cosmopolitan world of science today. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's that's what's fascinating about her because you know, uh, I mean, she was a female scientist heading a central botanical laboratory. She was responsible for, as you already shared with us, restructuring the botanical survey of India. She was responsible for setting up regional centers across India for the Botanical Survey of India. You know, so this is someone who is, you know, in many ways, the peer and colleague of people like Prasanta Chandra Mahalanobis, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar, Homi Jangir Baba, D.S. Kothari, Dalat Singh Kothari, others who are setting up similar labs across India and heading them and establishing centers across India, establishing research fields, experimental facilities, you know, the kind of infrastructure that was laid in order to make the scientific enterprise, in a sense, you know, grow with, this, with the status sort of agenda or, or the reason of state, as, as some of us would call it, in the middle decades of the 20th century. And, and she is literally, I mean, apart from Anamani, the only other female scientist who's working at that level. I mean, it's, it's astonishing that we do not have, um, we do not have more biographies of her, we do not have more information about her, we do not, in a way, you know, hold her up as a role model, also for um, the kind of discussions we have about gender and science today, you know, um, which is, um, which are, which are required, but you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's to me, to me quite astonishing. So, but it's, uh, so com coming back to the middle decades of the 20th century, and, and I, and I, and I love the way you alluded to, you know, that, that transition, because like all the other uh, people I mentioned right now, um, Janaki and Anamani are also characters of transition or, or personalities of transition or figures of transition. It's, it's that moment that moves from empire towards independence. Um, and, you know, their careers in a way change, right? Like at, at one moment, if you see, even, even for someone as, as sort of, you know, uh, uh, celebrated as C.V. Raman, at one moment, they are scientists of the, of citizens of the British empire. At another moment, they are Indian scientists. And, and in a way, how the world perceives them, but also how they perceive their own role in the establishment of this new India also changes within the span of less than a decade, right? Like it's yeah. the mid forties to early fifties, you just see their own perspective has, has changed. And so how do you, how in, in your reading, I mean, you know, the close reading that you've made of her character, her work, her letters, everything, how do you see this transition playing out? What did she think of empire? What did she think of independence? What did she think of, you know, the new state and its agenda coming up? It's very interesting. She had very close relationships, as I said, with the British scientific establishment, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, albeit uh, the patriarchal scientific establishment of Darlington and others, which had been established. But at the same time, when she was, uh, she also faced, as I said, uh, as early as the thirties, when she worked in the Sugarcane Breeding Institute in India, mm -hmm. the male Brahminical scientific establishment uh, of that institute, with Venkat Raman as being its head, and she was aware of both of these. And um, she she was uh, very critical of Venkatraman and was very very 
happy to visit C.V. Raman's uh, lab, which we know also was not a happy place for women from Abbasur's work. So, uh, the, uh, but she uh, was uh, very highly uh, sort of uh, complimentary about, about Raman and his, uh, uh, his, uh, his scientific um, work in, in the context of the how his lab function. So she was aware that there were these, um, uh, both, both in uh, India and in Britain, there were these pressures working on her. Hmm. But when she embraces, um, uh, and she's also tempted, for example, because the facilities offered to go back to England, also because of the relationship with Darlington and the scientific work she engaged in in the 40s. And she's tempted to go back to her attic flat in, uh, in Wisley. Mm -hmm. uh, but she, when Nehru sort of uh, interferes and, and invites her to work in India, and this is uh, 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 when she decides to stay on in India, she then makes a remarkable change. She makes a remarkable change in embracing a sort of uh, understanding of science, which she feels needs to be um, much more located within Indian universities. And here she is with uh, Meghnath Saha, and she's not with um, SS Bhatnaga, who believes who believes in the setting up of these independent nationalist laboratories. Yeah. She, I think, is very sad when science, um, uh, uh, the, the, with a much more utilitarian understanding of science, which India mm -hmm. embraced. Uh, in the 50s, and she would have uh, gone the way of Meghnath Saha. And there's this debate, which I think has been alluded to by others, much more quickly, we've looked at the debate in the 50s about where science should be located in the universities or in, the, in, the, or in these national laboratories. And I think she's at the losing end of that battle. And she's very critical of also her PhD students uh, that she then inherits because uh, she doesn't find them worthy enough. Um, um, but she had still has quite a remarkable coterie of uh, students and collaborators in India. So mm -hmm. work in India, I think, uh, uh, starts with a sense, uh, in some senses, on the wrong foot, where she's where she's on the side of Meghnath Saha, not on the side of setting up all these laboratories. But then when she does, but she does this remarkably well. But then when um, what happens, um, she's um, kind of uh, taken in by the fact. Uh, or she's very upset by the fact that the developmental agendas of the new Indian state are deforesting quite widely. Yeah. Um, and uh, she goes in trace of the Magnolia uh, tree, graffiti tree and finds only one left in Assam. So she has uh, got her finger on the pulse of what is happening in terms of development, deforestation and so on in the 1950s in India. And she's quite attuned and au uh, fait with that. She's also moving away from the Q paradigm. So mm -hmm. she understands that Q has had a hold in India. One of the first uh, directors appointed are, are, is this Jesuit, Shantapu, who is a Q appointee. But when she decides to move, when she is then, then asked to, um, she's then an officer on special duty. But then mm -hmm. when she's given the direction to reorganize the Banaling Survey, she's very clear that she wants to move away from Q. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, again, quite an independent uh, uh, analysis. Uh, of what Indian botany needs. Uh, and I think that is, again, testimony to her originality and her institutional building work, which is directing her away from the Q mm. paradigms uh, mm. of understanding, uh, uh, of conceptualizing Indian botany. And more of its floristic attachments to Malaysia, East Asia, and so on, which is something that she's very, very interested in, in her research work. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about what is it about the Q paradigm? So this is, of course, for those of you who probably haven't caught it yet, the Royal Kew Gardens, uh, Botanical yeah. Gardens in so London. So Kew had this, um, since uh, the 19th century, and uh, and, and uh, Hooker, who was one of the directors of Kew, um, who had uh, established the flora of British India in 12 volumes in the mm -hmm. 1870s, was no new flora of India. In fact, there's still no new flora of British India. And the Botanical Survey of India is still producing this new flora. Um, uh, I think they're meant to be about 30 volumes of their, they've done half of them so far. Okay. So the, the flora of uh, British India was a paradigmatic exercise on the basis of um, a, a uh, systematic botany that it established. And Jani K. Mal, when she takes over the reorganization of the Botanical Survey of India, she is moving away from that paradigm by uh, uh, much by understanding much more local variation and local affiliation and understanding of plants. So I think in some senses where you have the debate uh, among the lumpers and the splitters in terms of how you classify plants, there, mm -hmm. there was a sense in which she was more engaged in a floristic exercise which linked up 
uh, plants much more to their um, to to uh, to uh, East Asia, to Burma, uh, to Malaysia, and so on. So uh, she had a uh, you know she, again she was a field botanist. She was she's very often running away to the Irulas of Kerala or or or, or cultivating yams whenever she's distressed. For example, when uh, Shantapu was established, when Shantapu was appointed. A, as the, the first director by Q, she says, I'm devastated. I've run away to my Irulas uh, and I'm digging yams, you know. Uh, so it's, it's that field botany uh, and ethnobotany that she's very highly regarded for. And I think much of the, her, the interest in medicinal plants and ethnobotany also, um, uh, we need to understand her as one of the India's leading and original ethnobotanists. Yeah. So I'd just like to remind our audiences that they shouldn't allow me to monopolize the conversation before I post their questions in the Q&A box. So uh, my, my, I, I, have, I have a bunch of other questions to ask, but I'll, I'll start taking questions also from our audience. Yes. Um, so Poonam would like to know uh, if you might share your views on how a feminist perspective can differently contribute to our expanding understanding of science. Again, um... A very interesting question. Uh, one thing about Amal, Amal did not see herself as a feminist. It, mm. Hers was a life, um, a scientific life. She saw herself as a person of science, not as a man or a woman. And she never would have seen also, and, I, and that, that is remarkable. She never would have seen herself as being hard done by either on the basis of gender or race. And that is testimony to her supreme confidence as a scientist. Um, and it's only as, a, as a, a biographer that you can see how hard done by she was at mm -hmm. every step of her career. Um, and how both, I mean, when we view her through the prism of both gender and race, uh, we can see the unconscious and conscious biases uh, mm -hmm. that imposed a glass ceiling on her life, you know. Um, and I think for, uh, in terms of your question, uh, it is this glass ceiling um, that women in India then and now uh, have faced, are facing, um, Dalit women in particular will be facing in terms of uh, the, the opportunities for science, um, the opportunities, and also the way in which, for example, pure science in India uh, is, as Janaki Amal pointed out, not encouraged in the university. So do, do you know, so somehow to regenerate science in the universities to allow for a sort of creative um, scientific future for our young emerging scientists would be the way forward, I think, uh, to move away from a narrow utilitarian understanding of science, um, uh, to have much more blue sky research, which would bring in um, and, uh, you know, uh, feminine traditions of science and other traditions of uh, uh, indigenous traditions of science, reinvoking science in the universities, I think, in, in ways unimaginable, uh, unimaginable to us today um, would be the way forward, yeah. yeah. Um, I have Shubhashri here asking, uh, she thanks you, of course, for, for the wonderful talk. Um, she has two questions. Um, she would like to know more about the work that Janaki Amal did with Haldane. And um, uh, another question, which probably you could take first because it's probably easier to answer. Why is she referred to as Ammal when it is not exactly a surname? Ah, interesting. So let me answer the second question first. Um, the second question is uh, intriguing to me because when she is, when she was a Babu fellow, she she's known as Edvalatta Kakata Janaki. That's that's her name, which is you know the which is um, uh, the in Kerala and the matrilineal tradition, you take your name, um, your initials from your mother's house name. So Edavalatta is the uh, her mother, uh, her uh, mother's ha house name, Kakkat, her father's house name. So Ek uh, Ek Janaki would, would, was her was what she was known as. Now she adds the suffix of Amal at some point, and that I think is uh, um, um, uh, bowing to. Uh, 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 either the fact, and this is she's not ex uh, she's not uh, 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 explained in her letters. Apart from uh, telling John Darlington in one of her letters what EK stands for, she hasn't yeah. explained why she adds that suffix or when she adds that. But obviously, to add a second name, 
So you add a second name, Amal being a South Indian name. It could be uh, bowing to caste preference. I mean, this I do not know. I haven't established. I cannot say this for her. But certainly it was a second name that she uh, added. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. The other question about what she did with Holdane, her, her work with Holdane uh, was in the form of, she didn't uh, work, collaborate with Holdane. Uh, she submitted articles for his journal. And she uh, uh, was very active in um, showing him around parts of India. Hmm. Um, uh, so she uh, was instrumental in taking him to several different laboratories uh, and tours around India when he arrived and working with um, some of his junior colleagues. So she, uh, her collaborative work was mainly, as I said, her work, uh, her primary work was on intergeneric hybrids and plants, uh, which she had worked with, with Darlington. And some of these, uh, fl these, these plants were flowering 20 years later. Uh, and she was getting them into the journals of science and heredity, sometimes with the help of Amal, uh, sometimes with the help of Darlington, and sometimes with, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Holden. You know, when I, when I when I look at uh, when I understand now that Amal was was a name she took on in a sense um, later in life. I mean, you know, it, it also reminds me of what C. V. Raman did, right? Like, yeah. it, uh, it it's a name he took on in order to become more legible in a sense to the larger yeah. scientific community. It's a name people can remember. It's a name people can actually take on as opposed to the longer um, you know name which they might not be able to either pronounce. I mean, we you know those, these problems continue even today. And at that yeah, point, yeah, I can only yeah. imagine it was much harder. Yeah. And so, Amal is, uh, not, is more, more common in, in Tamil Nadu than it is in uh, Kerala. So it's interesting that she chose that South Indian suffix of Amal. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. So I think it, that the, whether it would be interesting to see whether there was a caste preference there, whether she was disguising the caste, that could be an element there. But uh, yeah. there's nothing in her letters to indicate that. So I, as a biographer, I cannot say that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you are writing a biography. I mean, as a nascent biographer of sorts. Wonderful. Uh, I'm, not, wonderful. I'm, not, I'm not at the moment, no, um, seriously writing a biography, yeah. Okay, no, it would, it would be lovely to see a biography come, you know, yes. because I think there are people working the, on it and I encourage them to do so, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's it, a neglected genre. I mean, it's yeah, a neglected, it's a, yeah. yeah uh, and, and one would love to see that happen. Um, you know, I mean, and this just, brings me also to you know the the question of archives right archives for the history of contemporary science in india we just it it it, it is such an incredibly impoverished landscape you know we we do not uh, you know we, we do not have a symmetry of sources in a sense right because the personal papers often of scientists who live and work in india are not available as opposed to the personal papers for um, you know uh, scientists in europe or america especially uh, you you know what Holden wrote to a colleague or a friend, including the you know the love and the insults and the tenderness and and everything, right? It, it's there, and you understand people. But often, I mean, in, in, in India, personal papers are almost extremely you know, well, no, they're almost not there, and they're extremely hard to come by. And people are reluctant to leave personal papers um, in institutional archives, for example, which is which is a tragedy because it means uh, you know writing biographies is that much harder. You can yes, only absolutely. write from institutional papers or professional archives of people available, and and mm -hmm. uh, I mean you can write, you can have biographies of someone like Mohandas Gandhi or Jawaharlal Nehru because they left behind personal papers, their letters with their warts and all personalities are available for us to see to write a biography. Um, in the case of science, it's 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 really really difficult. Um, I mean, it is shocking. I mean, with, with Janaki Amal in particular, uh, I really feel strongly. I, reckon, I I second everything that you've said. And India really needs to think really clearly about how it accesses these. Because her, she, was, she died in 1984. She was mm. living in Madhuravel. Mm. Uh, she was very well known by the scientific establishment um, yeah. low, you know, by then. Nobody made an effort yep. uh, to take either her library or her archives. And that, that, I mean, in the 80s, that's still quite shocking when we have an archival tradition. Yes. And uh, um, yeah, so and her entire slide collection was mm, smashed oh. to bits. So she had a private library in um, Edathil House in Telichuri, yeah. uh, which was sold a few years later. And her letters were found floating in the rain. 
um, after it was sold. So it's not that we are not aware of our importance, it's that the institutes themselves, the Botanical Survey of India, could only find her published manuscripts for me, published work for me. Yep. Yeah. They could find That's... nothing archival for me. And oh. that is a tragedy which India really needs. And someone like you in a position now, well, I mean, who, who's, who's voicing this, I think we'll be able to do a lot more in this regard where we collect them now, you know. Yes, yes. So we are trying, we are trying, we're trying to set up a project called Recollect India, where we are starting out with oral history so that at least we, we in a way, catch the memories of those who are still around, the first generation of free India scientists, engineers and lab technicians. And then through that, hopefully also get them to give personal papers, etc., um, and objects to established archives which can preserve them through which we can, you know, populate the history of science in India. For example, Ms. Swaminathan. MS, she worked quite closely with Ms. Swaminathan in the Silent Valley project, you know. Yeah. So, so Ms. Swaminathan would be someone who should be on your list as well, who's still alive. and Most certainly. Most certainly. Thank you. We'll be in touch about that. I'll go, I'll move on to a question uh, from Dhanya Lakshmi. Um, She's, who's a clinical geneticist, and she wants to know, uh, or she's curious to find out, if Janaki Amal did support the eugenics movement at large, and if, if at all, did she have any explanation for it later? So once again, these all I have is a letter. She didn't write on eugenics. If you want to um, read the eugenicist stuff that was coming out in the 30s, Darlington is his evolutionary ideas, which were really, really... Uh, have been really criticized by everyone um, on races of man. But what he, uh, is where you go to see what uh, people like Darlington were thinking in the 40s uh, uh, until the UNESCO um, uh, 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 statement of 19, uh, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So, but what Darlington was doing, he was visiting India periodically hmm. and Janaki would supply him material on castes and races and tribes of India. And that material would feed into his eugenic ideas. Oh so whether she was doing it wittingly or unwittingly or critically, it's not clear from the letters. But hmm. certainly she was sending him material. Hmm. Uh, her own views on it is, um, I'm sure, um, again, this is, uh, you know, her scientific words were very much linked to cytology and botany and, and intergeneric hybrids. Uh, she didn't write on this uh, topic at all, but she was very interested in the, the medicinal and ethnobotanical knowledge of lower castes and, and tribes hmm. and, and indigenous knowledge. But it was not racialized in the way in which you, the eugenics movement was racializing the stuff. Um, it was very much, she was aware, she was interested in difference. She was interested in um, the anthropology of difference, uh, but she was not um, a eugenicist in any form or shape is my mm -hmm. understanding. Okay. Uh, we have Unikrishnam from Telicheri who uh, says that as far as he's aware, uh, and he comes from Telicheri, he's, uh, Ammal has been, or Ammar has been uh, usually associated with upper caste women. It is a term associated with respectability. That might have something to do with the choice. Yeah, I think yeah, it yeah, aligns yeah. with what you were saying. Yes, yes. yes. Um, what you were saying. Um, now, uh, I have Aman asking, can you tell us more about Janaki's role as a public scientist in influencing the discourse on environmental conservation? So this stage of her life, she was already very critical of the deforestation of India in the 1950s and um, the developmental agendas of the Indian state. And I, if, we, if we look at what was happening po immediately post-independence, and this is a history of the Indian environment that needs to be written, and if there's anyone out there who wants to write it, they should do it. Um, because immediately after 47, um, there was uh, a huge amount of environmental destruction that happened. Uh, uh, the Americans were going around, uh, in fact, shooting uh, tigers. They were being, it, it, it was free for all before, um, as we know, the setting up of uh, regulations, and then later on, um, Jairam Ramesh has written quite in, uh, instructively about uh, Mrs. Gandhi and, and setting up of environmental regulations in India. But there was a period between the 50s and the 60s that it was free for all. And Johnny Gimal was, um, uh, was uh, 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 aware of this, and she was very highly critical of this, and she was, she was lending a voice to the environmental conservation movement. 
And most notably, um, the environmental conservation in the 70s with regard to the Silent Valley. So when the Silent Valley happened, she, along with other scientists, she was not the only one, uh, she becomes very interested in carrying out uh, a, a botanical survey of the plants and trees of the Silent Valley as a project for the government of India. Hmm. Um, she talks a lot about unfinished, pro uh, some of these projects which were finished or unfinished, but I think her voice is very, very important and instrumental in the conservation of the Silent Valley, along with other scientists hmm. like B.C. Paul and uh, M.S. Swaminathan. So yes, in terms of conservation, very aware of it, um, very sad about what was happening in terms of development, and then quite actively conserving the Silent Valley. Uh, when it came. And with that, by then she was quite old. She was in her 70s and she was writing extensive letters to Darlington about mm -hmm. her role in, uh, in, in the Silent Valley movement. Yes. I remember re reading some of those. Um, yes. The other question that Amina has for you is, what changes did Janaki Amal bring about in the Botanical Survey of India? So what was, in a sense, the scope of change or what did she imagine needed to be changed at all? So I think she reorganized it regionally. Uh, there were several, and I've, um, uh, the, the, the uh, but, you know, I'm trying to see. So basically when she reorganizes it, um, I have um, a section here where I've talked about a uh, reorganization of the survey. Into, I'll give you the different um, areas which she reorganized it in to. Um, sorry, I'm giving you the state. So she's um, uh, reorganizing it into the different uh, territorial. Uh, so the, I still haven't found it. But it's, um, it's quite interesting that you know, should uh, enter and reorganize and exist. I mean, it's a it's a fairly um, it's it's. I mean, the Botanical Survey of India belongs. So yeah, yeah. So I'm just giving Department. you the date. Um, so in um, uh, she becomes an officer on special duty at the regional. Research Laboratory, Jammu, from 1959 to 62. Uh, so she reorganizes, uh, she becomes the chairman of the Cytogenetics Department, the Regional Research Laboratory, uh, again in Jammu until 1964. Um, she organizes the, uh, before this, she's reorganized the, um, uh, the, she set up the Botanical uh, Lab uh, Survey of India till 1954, so from 52 to 54. She's an officer on special duty for reorganizing the Botanical Survey of India. Mm. Uh, she becomes the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory of the Botanical Survey of India until 1959. And this when she's reorganizing, when she's becoming the director of the Central Botanical Laboratory in 1959, that she sets up these different botanical circles in mm. various parts of India. So she's reorganizing the entire flora of India along regional lines. Mm. So you have it in, in South India, in, in uh, uh, in uh, Jammu, for example. So all these areas are set up to understand the plant, the history of these regions. So in some senses, that is the work now because the, the number of circles in, in the Botanical Laboratory under the Botanical Survey of India today is all marshaled around creating this new flora of India, which hasn't been produced, as I said, since um, Hooker did it in, 18, in the 1870s. So her work still generating the new flora for India on a regional basis through the regional reorganizing of the Botanical Survey of India into these different circles all over India. Mm. I, I suppose yeah. that makes sense. Yes, yes. And, and uh, so I think organizing it around, I mean, you know, the Botanical Survey of India is among the earliest surveys, right? Like it's, yes. it's, it belonged to the middle decades of the 19th century. It's 1857 yes, yes. with the arrival of the rule of Queen Victoria. And I mean, you know, they're imperial institutions, right? Like yes. to, map the, to map what in those days was called the wealth of India. Right, which yes. included, of course, flora, fauna, and minerals. And, so these and, are regional uh, laboratories that she, that she is setting up, and different circles that she is setting up at that time. Yeah, yeah. Which is so. So I think it's 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 sort of fascinating to see that she takes sort of a nearly hundred year old institution to reorganize it, um, and and in along a way, regional over, lines. Yes. Yeah, along regional lines, and therefore also away from the concerns of imperial India. 
to newer concerns in that transition to in, independence. In transition, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that's the interesting bit. For those of you who have the opportunity in Jammu, there's a herbarium that um, Janaki yeah. Amal uh, collected and it's still available to see. So if you have the opportunity, do uh, do take a look. Um, uh, ah, there we go. I, I was wondering where she was. Uh, Sita Reddy has joined us and, oh, well, she's probably been here all, all while, but she has a, a lovely question, which is, uh, could you tell us a little about the new rose hybrid that's been named for Janaki Ammal? Oh, yeah, that's a very sweet question. So the... Uh, uh, the two uh, rose breeders, um, uh, Girija and Venugopal and, and, and uh, Vivi Giri and, uh, uh, in, in South India, uh, have mm -hmm. set up this new, new rose hybrid in honor of Johnny Kemal. And this is a perfectly hybrid pink rose that uh, you can order. I've had it sent to me and it's a great honor. I'm sure that it's been planted now in the John Innes Institute as well. Um, and it's been sent to various people. Just It's just a hybrid in honor of her. Um, she herself is well known for the magnolia tree that if you go to the John Innes that you'll find yes. that she uh, is known as a magnolia, Janaki magnolia cobus. And hmm. you, can, you can find it if, on a visit to, uh, the, to Wisley, the Royal Horticultural Institute in Wisley. Okay. Uh, does it... This is hearsay. I have no idea. Does it have anything to do with the with with the sort of lavender pink saris that she had, or that was among her favorite colors, or something? You know, she also wore saffron. I don't know whether that's the case. I think okay. that she, um, it was just something that uh, Girija and Virugiri, they just developed out hmm. of their interest in rose hybrids. Okay, interesting and and quite lovely. Um, quite lovely. Yes. So I, I have a question. I, I'm not entirely sure how you'll think about it, but but let's try it anyway. Um, Sabita from London, you probably know her, um, has a question. How do you think young girls could be inspired to take up the study of botany, which is not as glamorous as AI or technology or something else? What could we do differently? What could you know, in a, say, in a way, the education system do differently. What can be done to, in a way, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, while this is, you know, young girls, etc. I mean, you know, Sabita's concerns are, are well taken on board. But I think the larger question still is a, is a very, you know, it's, it's an interesting and fascinating question about what is the place of pure science in a, in a really sort of rapid changing, um, fascinated with speed, um, you know, kind of new horizon where the word innovation, which I which I find extremely difficult to deal with, in a way eclipses all um, interaction with nature or understanding of nature or, you know, sort of in a way distances um, learning and, and education from nature. So, you know, how does one bring about that love for science back? No way, again, Fascinating question. Thank you for that. I, you know, botany used to be a preserve of women in the early part of, in the late 19th century and the early part of the century, uh, 20th century in Britain. So mm. botany, in fact, was uh, downgraded as a science in Britain because of its association with women. Yes. It's only later on that it's links with genetics, cytology, genetics. Um, it, it enters, you know, it gets much more uh, credence as a as, as a science, but of course now in the context of uh, um, climate change and, uh, and the Anthropocene and so on, I think botany is is extremely plans and and the future of our uh, and planetary health is, is seems to be quite linked. And um, uh, I don't think we need any encouragement to if you are interested in plants um, to be able to uh, you know, get onto that. Um, uh, bandwagon and, and become a plant scientist. Um, and I think plants are becoming much more fashionable. Uh, and as an environmental historian, looking at the history of uh, plant knowledge and plant transfers and, um, and not so much in plant science, that's not what I'm interested in, but um, plants have always been very much part of uh, the resource gathering of empires and plant knowledge has been very much part of um, from 1500 the East India companies onwards um, till about 1900, 
botany and empire and rivalry were, were linked in resource extractions around the world. And I think plants still have a very important role to play in medicine and now in the changing way in which we, uh, in, in, in terms of the environment, um, they help us understand climate change. Um, and they are the future if we want to, if, if we want to save our planet, you know. Um, yeah. All sorts of plants. And Janaki was interested in all sorts of crop, you know, crop plants. Um, uh, she was interested, I suppose, in intergeneric hybrids. She was interested in uh, medicinal plants. Uh, so it plants, you know, you know, we need to embrace plants for the future of the planet. Absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, well, you know, that's my answer. If that helps. Yes. And thank you. That, that's like, that sounds like a good note to call this evening to a close. Thank you so much, Vinita, for taking the time to be with us this evening. It's, it's been a wonderful journey with you through the world of plants, but also absolutely crucially the world of Janaki Ammal, a fascinating figure who I, would love for all of us to engage with more seriously than we have until now. Thank you all for joining us this evening, taking the time to continue to join us as we sort of you know, unfold Phytopia uh, through this week. Do please, those of you who haven't yet had the chance, visit the exhibition and also visit the essay and photographs that Vinita has contributed to the exhibition about Janaki Ammal. Last but not least, do please, consider filling out the feedback form because it's very important for us to learn what it is you think about what we offer and what you think we might offer more and better. Thanks again, everybody. And Phytopia comes to a close at the end of the week. So please do join us and enjoy and good night. Thank you. <laughs>